There are two names forever associated with the macabre, Burke and Hare. And in the early 19th century, Burke and Hare were two grave robbers, or resurrection men as they were known. They killed 17 people and sold their cadavers to the medical college in Edinburgh because in those days there were no bodies for scientific research. So Burke and Hare provided a rather gruesome service. Hare was born in Points Pass in the county Armagh and William Burke was born in the area known as Orney, near Straban on the River Finn. He had worked in the Donegal militia and then emigrated to Scotland and found employment as a navvy. Hare was given immunity from prosecution and he testified against his accomplice, Burke. And this testimony led to the death sentence being passed on his old friend in December 1828. William Burke was hanged in January 1829 and his body was publicly dissected in the Edinburgh Medical College. The dissecting professor Alexander Munro dipped his quill into Burke's blood and wrote the following. This is written with the blood of William Burke, who was hanged at Edinburgh. This blood was taken from his head. John McNaughton, you have been found guilty of the murder of Anne Knox of Prehen House. You shall be taken from this court to a place of execution where you shall be hanged by the neck until dead, dead, dead. One of the earliest public hangings associated with Lifford Jail is that of John McNaughton. And his story has gone down in notoriety. And though it took place in 1761, over 250 years ago, it is still remembered in the area and indeed has become part of the local folk life. John McNaughton was born in Ballamoney in the county Antrim. He was the son of a gentleman. And when his father died, he left him £500 a year, which was a considerable amount of money in those days. Young McNaughton went to Dublin University and, uh, alas, did not finish his education, but instead he followed that other 18th century pastime, the life of the rake. He became a gambler, a drinker, a wencher, and, and many other activities only found in the city. Subsequently, he fell in love and married a young girl, Mary Daniel, who was the daughter of the Dean of Down. Now, McNaughton had promised to give up his wicked ways, and for two years he abstained from gambling. He fell back into his old ways, however, and his debts mounted up and increased, and he was arrested. And such was the shock that his wife, who was now heavy with child, died from distress. McNaughton fell in hard times, until an old friend, Andrew Knox, invited John to come and stay with him and his family. Andrew Knox was a member for the Irish Parliament for Donegal, and he lived at Prehen House just outside Derry. John took Knox up on his offer and soon settled into his new abode. It wasn't long before John McNaughton became interested in Andrew Knox's 15-year-old daughter, Mary Ann. Some say he was passionately in love with her. Others will say that her £5,000 fortune 
was a much greater attraction. Well, whatever the reason, McNaughton wanted to marry Mary Ann. Some say that they had secretly married. Others say that they wanted to marry. But what we can say with certainty is that Mary Ann's father, Andrew Knox, was determined that they would never be together. Truth, what do I find here? Mary Ann, what are you doing lurking in a corner? Well, I told you that my daughter was my pride and joy. Well, what do I find you doing? You are never to go near her again. Do you understand? Do you understand? Be gone with you. To protect his beloved daughter from McNaughton's advances, Andrew Knox decided to send her to Dublin. And he set out with her by coach, protected by armed outriders. John McNaughton heard of this plan. And he, together with a few accomplices, lay in wait. They stopped the coach just below Burndennet Bridge. A short, angry discussion ensued and shots were fired. McNaughton fired into the coach. The Mary Ann was killed. Norton ran away to the hayloft in Sandville and after they searched for him, authorities couldn't catch him until one man pointed to where he lay in hiding. And some say that that man who informed lost that very arm in a mill accident years later. McNaughton was taken to the new jail at Lifford and there he waited for one month until his trial. Indeed, he was taken to Lifford Jail because it was said that Straban Jail was neither secure enough nor clean enough to hold such an important prisoner. John McNaughton you have been found guilty of the murder of Anne Knox of Prehen House. You shall be taken from this court to a place of execution where you shall be hanged by the neck until dead, dead, dead. And so it was that on the 15th day of December 1761, John McNaughton was led to the gallows in Straban. It should be noted that the local populace believed that McNaughton was in a way an innocent party and he had been merely trying to detain his wife. They had nothing to do with the execution. And in an ironic twist of fate, some relatives of Miss Knox and some friends built the gallows. The rope was placed around McNaughton's neck. He was so consumed with his guilt that he jumped from the gallows and the rope snapped. And in those days it was believed that if the hangman's noose snapped it was divine intervention and the condemned man was allowed to live. Not so McNaughton. He said, I do not wish to be remembered as half-hanged McNaughton. And with the noose around his neck, he jumped from the gallows and was dispatched. And to this day, he is still remembered as half-hanged.